go ahead and get started. It is 632 now. So welcome everyone to our Environmental Justice Pathways webinar, Oregon's History of African American and Japanese Timber Workers. Um, I am so excited for our panel tonight. We have some amazing speakers. And so I'm just going to jump right into it and just um, go through some webinar logistics really quick. So all participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can also adjust how you view your screen on the upper right hand corner and you'll see a little box saying change view. All right, and here is our quick agenda for this evening. So I'm going to give a land acknowledgement and then the portion of the webinar will be a moderated panel discussion and then we'll have some time at the end for some panel Q&A. And so before we get started, uh, the Beyond Toxic staff, they would like to share a land acknowledgement. So our hope is that by taking this step, we honor the forgotten histories of the original people of this land and the knowledge of their descendants who are still living here today. And so we acknowledge that we are on Kalapuya Alihi, the homelands of the Kalapuya people in the Willamette Valley. Their descendants still live here. We are honored to share the land and take part in safekeeping its resources for future generations. We commit to respect the rights, traditions, and knowledge of the Winfelli Kalapuya people. And so now I'm excited to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. So uh, we have Lisa Arkin, the Executive Director of Beyond Toxics. Prior to her work with Beyond Toxics, Lisa spent, sorry about that, so you can see her picture. Lisa spent 13 years as an educator and an associate professor at both Stanford University and the University of Oregon. She has since accumulated deep experience in toxics use reduction advocacy, land use planning, environmental protection, and strategic development for nonprofit organizations. And Lisa has served as our executive director since 2005. So take it away, Lisa. Thank you very much, Haley, and welcome everybody to Oregon Grassroots Environmental and Racial Justice Organizations Beyond Toxics and the NAACP of Springfield and Eugene have put three years into planning the first Oregon Environmental Justice Pathways Summit <clears throat> and the series of webinars of which tonight is the last. The Environmental Justice Pathways Summit is just a few days away. It's scheduled for April 9th and 10th and it will be held in conjunction with the Climate Change and Indigenous Peoples Lecture. The keynote speakers for the 2021 summit are Sheila Watt-Clotier, former international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar S Council, and Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, the former leader of the environmental justice programs at the US EPA under the Bush and Obama administrations. All events during the summit are free and they're virtual, so you can enjoy them from your living room or your kitchen, but you got to register to attend and you can easily do that at the link that I hope somebody's going to put in the chat for you, ejpsummit.org. The summit and the webinar series are generally su generously supported by the Meyer Memorial Trust the University of Oregon Center for Environmental Futures, the Saris Trust, Spring Creek Project at OSU, the Grand Ronde Tribe, and generous other sponsors. So on to tonight's webinar, the Oregon's history of African-American and Japanese timber workers. As I said, is the last in an eight-part series of webinars that were created from the 2020 Environmental Justice Pathway Summit as an outreach project when the summit was canceled just three weeks before it was supposed to start when we uh, were in the midst of realizing what COVID-19 was doing to our communities and everything shut down. We took the panels that were planned for the summit and shared them as individual webinars, spread them throughout the entire year. Gwen Trice and Linda Tamura, our speakers tonight, were two of the four speakers on the plenary panel, which was the first panel of the series back on April 16th. Their research on the experience of African-American loggers in Wallowa County and Japanese farmers in Hood River County 
is so rich and so compelling that we wanted to invite them back to delve deeper into the history of those peoples. Tonight, they will focus exclusively on the role of African-American and Japanese timber workers during the 1920s and 30s. These decades were formative years that built up Oregon's timber economy and established its place as the nation's prominent supplier of timber products. It's essential to study and understand the role of workers from other cultures and races who compromised the backbone of Oregon's timber industry and contributed to its vast wealth, but who never profited from this wealth themselves. And instead, who encountered prejudice, experienced exclusion, and endured a number of burdens that Gwen and Linda will discuss in their presentation tonight, including low wages and poor living conditions. These men have never been recognized for their skilled labor, their hard work, their entrepreneurial energy, and truly without this immensely skillful workforce, Oregon's timber industry would not have developed to the level of productivity and prosperity that it did. In fact, in historical accounts of Oregon's timber industry, we have only been told one side of the story. We have only to look at the imagery promoted at our state's capital to see how powerfully and convincingly our perceptions of Oregon timber heroes have been and continue to be shaped by the myths perpetuated by the white settler colonial ethos and the concept of manifest destiny. Atop Oregon's Capitol building stands a bearded, brawny, golden pioneer logger who kind of looks like Superman. And in fact, they were both created in the same year of 1938. This was also the same year that Oregon took the lead as the nation's top timber product supplier. Our state capital's golden lager is the perfect gilded Paul Bunyan who has just chopped out a tree with his big gold ax. He stands high above Salem, the entire city looking west and he stands in front of a big gold stump. The Oregon pioneer lager, well actually the Oregon pioneer which is his official name, I call him the Oregon lager, he stands 22 feet high, he weighs nine tons, and is covered with 23 karat gold leaf. He is the symbol of what Oregon wanted to portray that it stood for. White settlers conquering the land and cutting down the natural resources for personal and corporate gain, while forming a state that adopted exclusionary laws, including sundowner and lash laws, into its state constitution. And until I met Gwen Trice at the Maxville Heritage Museum in Joseph in 2019, I too assumed that the golden lager represented the only truth about Oregon's history of natural resource management. The presentation by Gwen and Linda will reveal that there are other heroes in the Oregon origin story who are descendants of African-Americans who were enslaved in the South or Native American peoples already living in Oregon, or immigrants from Japan, China, and India. These workers and their families contributed to the timber empires and the vast wealth of companies like Weyerhaeuser and Stimson Lumber. It is true that up until very recently, Oregon's leaders have preferred that Oregonians not think about how white colonial settler values have shaped our perceptions of what communities should look like. So I just want to end by saying this may be a topic and a gathering space that causes some discomfort or brings up feeling. These topics can cause hurt and trauma. And we are aware of this and we welcome you and support you in your own awareness of your responses. These topics that we're exploring together and we have a passion for, and we think are important to discuss together, will help us stay curious and stay engaged in a good way. Please listen fully and attentively to our speakers as they tell their stories. Please ask questions 
from your own perspectives and don't assume that you can speak for the experience of others. Speak from your own truth and acknowledge what you don't know and humbly and respectfully ask for more information. We hope tonight's event will add to your growing collection of narratives that lift up the people of color in Oregon's journey. Our first speaker tonight is Gwendolyn Trice, Executive Director of the Maxville Heritage Interpretive Museum. This museum is located in Joseph, Oregon, and its mission is to gather, preserve, and share the rich history of African American, indigenous, and immigrant loggers in the Pacific Northwest. The center utilizes inclusive stories of multicultural logging communities to better connect the experiences of immigrants and migrants to the larger American narrative. <clears throat> Gwen served on the Oregon State Advisory Commission of Black Affairs and serves today on the State Advisory on Historic Preservation. And she is a 2015 recipient of the Oregon Women of Achievement Award, a nationally certified interpretive guide in 2017 and the 2020 Stewardship Award recipient from the Museum of Natural and Cultural History at the University of Oregon. I am so pleased to have Gwen speak with you, us tonight and share her knowledge. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction. And I want to say briefly that it's a privilege and an honor to be here this evening um, with um, the folks from Beyond Toxic that are hosting the, um, the series. And it's just been um, an opportunity of growth and um, character building and um, partnership and friendship building in this process. So I'm super excited to be here. So let's jump right in. Let's get excited about this. So I'm speaking absolutely from the African American loggers that are part of the great migration from the South, yet not part of the telling of the American narrative. So I do hope to give you a slice of this history that will begin to fill the narrative. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on Maxville. That's where the descendants of my family came from. But um, I reference other locations um, because it helps to inform my narrative. And so you'll hear the word Vernonia located in Columbia County. They had a Japanese quarter, Filipino quarter, and a black quarter there. The Mount Emily Lumber Company, located in Union County, had a Native American quarter, Greek quarter, Japanese quarter, and white quarter. Um, I will reference We California, that had a black quarter, and the rest of the community that consisted of many other groups of people, including Greek and Chinese and whites, they all lived within the community, and only the black community lived in a quarter at the logging site. And then finally, just I reference a little bit when I look at the work that we've done, McNary, Arizona, which used to be McNary, Louisiana. They picked up the name, the town, the workers, the equipment, and created um, a logging community in McNary, Arizona, with a black quarter, a native quarter, Hispanic quarter, and a white quarter. And so this is only where we are today of digging into the meat of the work that we do. So just note that I may have references because we've done documentation research and some interviews around that. So I will go please to the next slide. So Maxville, according to our research today, was founded as a timber community ahead of other towns that we've mentioned that came in to Oregon. They were established in 1923 and their official time was 1923 to 1933. However, some of those um, community members 
stayed there to the mid 1940s where um, there was a, a heavy snow and a, a lot of the buildings collapsed. A lot of the people that lived in Maxville, they recruited people from the South, both African-American and Southern whites from the South and the Midwest. And the company was called the Bowman Hicks Lumber Company that established that space there that had holdings in the South. And so they really came in and they brought their workers that were multi um, talented. They did many jobs um, before they came to Maxville, but the African-American men essentially were used as sawyers. And so they manned two person cross cut saws and fell the timber. But a lot of those men also had other skill sets. So um, as I've looked through some of my references, um, there were some that helped to work on the engines of the of the um, locomotives and as well as take care of the 17 horses that were used to um, help to pull and to move timber on that in that space. Next slide, please. So we, I think about social changes from the South to Oregon. And I was born and raised in Oregon. And so the US Constitution that um, the 15th Amendment, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Next slide, please. When Oregon joined the union, they were the only state that joined with their own constitution in place, that no free Negro or mulatto not residing in the state at the time of adoption of this constitution shall come, reside, or be within this state, or hold, it only, uh, or hold any real estate, or make any contracts, or maintain any suit therein. And the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes, mulattoes, and for their effectual exclusion from the state and for the punishment of persons who shall bring them into the state or employ or harbor them. Next slide, please. So Maxville was started in 1923 and those laws that were on the books and they stayed on the books and actually one noted um, situation where a gentleman that had holdings in Oregon was sued for being black in the state of Oregon and had to leave within 30 days. Um, that didn't happen in Eastern Oregon, it, but it, it's, um, it's part of our history of um, the laws being used to remove someone that really had standing in the community and holdings and to make them go away. Next slide, please. So, or, or <clears throat> excuse me, Maxville um, was like a lot of towns in Oregon. They had um, different types of logging. So we're up here in Eastern Oregon in the mountains. And so there wasn't um, waterways to bring them down. It was by the use of, of railroad. So it would be considered a railroad logging town. There was no mill up at Maxville. It was down in Willa the town of Wallawa. And then Bowman Hicks also had another mill in the town of La Grande. And so they moved millions of board feet in that space. And there were certain guidelines and, and um, for these industries that, um, that men, families be separated by ethnicity and by marital status. So the black men lived on one side and their families, the white families lived in one area and then the white single men lived in, and had their food served in a different space. And you'll find that same um, type of industry standard happened across um, 
different logging communities is the pay was more here. However, it, you were paid based on the type of job that you had and it wasn't a choice for the African American men that came they were they received more money and this this town also housed families but they housed it segregated so two different schools two different sides of town and they had a baseball team with two a black team and a white team that on occasion played together and uh, they'd come together to play other teams within the community but they would play each other separately when th when there was spare time whatever that looks like in that world they lived in because it was very harsh conditions with 20 you know 20 below zero during the winter time five and a half feet of snow it was very rugged living and their houses reflected that next slide please and so this is some of the ways that they would log. They would stack up those that the, that timber. And in the wintertime, it was easier to drag those logs over the frozen land. And so this is one of the ways that they decked those. Next slide, please. And then they moved them out via the train to the mills and um, made those connections. They also, the mills would make certain housing. So the white houses were a little bit fancier. There was no running water in the houses. Some of the manager's houses, I understand, did have hand pumps in them. Next slide, please. But here's um, my favorite picture of the two teams at Maxville playing baseball. Um, so this was definitely a way that the cultures came together and connected through um, the space that they lived in because they were separate from the other townships and it was another way that relationships be, could be built. Next slide, please. So this is an example of one of the white homes that would have been built at the mill and then they would bring them up um, by the rail and they would skid them out. So there were no houses with any foundation. They were shiplap. They, had no insulation. So when the weather was cold, it was cold for everyone. Everyone heated with wood and cooked with wood and washed their clothes and had outhouses. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the African Amer American housing that they, a lot of these, they had these makeshift um, rail cars that were built on top of um, uh, flatbeds so that they could hook them up and pull them out to work and when they were done they would bring them back to the positions um, at their site and if you look in the forefront you'll see that they also raised um, pigs and as uh, another form of sustenance. Next slide please. And this is a great picture I got I was contacted by the gentleman who's the little kid in this picture. His name's Ray Puckett. And he and his family came from Arkansas. They waited in Wallowa till their house was built. Notice what's on their wall. Their insulation is newspaper. And that was one of the ways that they could stay warm. And um, when I met and began to talk with Ray, he was 96 years old. So this was his family coming out here. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is, you know, they had two schools. The white school was much larger. Maxville had approximately 400 people that lived there with approximately 60 of them being African American. Next slide, please. And this is a wonderful picture that was given to me by um, a gentleman. I believe his mother is the young girl standing beside the woman with the baby, that's his mom. So his mom and his grandmother in these pictures. And he had a series of several pictures of their family and some of the other um, women and children that made connections at Maxville. And this family um, did not come from the South. A lot of the people that lived there were also connected through the um, 
the homestead families that were there. And so different people logged and worked along with those two Southern groups of people. Next slide, please. So I'm at the end of mine. I just wanted to show you some pictures of, of Maxville today. This is just, I only have two here. We have been working with students at Eastern Oregon University. And so that's come out of it. And then the next slide, please. I love to end on this one with an eagle that flew over while we were on the site. And we just felt so blessed that the site is, you know, becoming sacred with the work that we're doing in that space that my family, it was maybe a, illegal by the laws on the books for them to be there, but for us to be there and to do the work of education and connection is critical. And it's so important to lift up these stories. and. My last slide is just about who we are and Maxville. You can come to our website and you can contact me through that website as well if you have more questions. And so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Gwen. That was great. And uh, we'll be peppering you with questions later. <laughs> so, uh, get ready. And I'm um, pleased to also introduce our second set of speakers, Linda Tamura and Lucy Capehart. Linda is the co-editor-in-chief of the Oregon Encyclopedia. She's also a professor emeritus of education, emerita, excuse me, at Willamette University. Uh, and she is the author of Hood River Issei, an oral history of Japanese settlers in Oregon's Hood River Valley. <clears throat> and this was published by the University of Illinois Press in 1993. And Nisei Soldiers Break Their Silence, Coming Home to Hood River, published by the University of Washington Press in 2012. Linda curated What If Heroes Were Not Welcome Home, a traveling exhibit from the Oregon Historical Society. And she is joined by her colleague, Lucy Capehart, who has been a museum professional for over 20 years. Lucy is currently the Director of Collections and Exhibits at the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. It's located in Portland. And I hear they just moved or just about to move and have their grand opening. So I'm hoping they'll tell us more about that. Uh, Lucy is also a practicing artist whose work has been published nationally and is in the collection of the Portland Art Museum and the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, among others. So we're so glad to have you here tonight. And thank you, Linda and Lucy. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, Lisa, you've done a little bit of research on me, I can tell. <laughs> We're thrilled to, to be here. Uh, uh, and thank you so much to Beyond Toxics for your work in encouraging us to research and tell the story of Japanese timber workers. We're going to focus on four questions. And our first question is, how did Japanese become Oregon timber workers. So we're be going to begin um, in Japan and we'll focus on the push and the pull between Japan and the United States. In Japan, there was a new Meiji gov government in 1868 and they implemented changes, education, banking, the postal service, a new rail system, the military. In order to pay for those changes, they levied heavy taxes on the landowners and especially the farmers. That was coupled with famines and poor harvests, as well as the fact that in Japan, the eldest son inherited the property and the name. And so the younger sons really didn't have a means to support themselves. And with the current situation in Japan, it was even worse. The pull in the United States began with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And in that way, the United States lost its source of, quote, cheap 
labor. Um, two years later, Japan allowed um, its working class to emigrate from the country in order to become contract laborers. And then in the late 1890s with the Alaska gold rush, when that drained workers who wanted to pan for gold, um, there really was a need for, for laborers. And so Japanese laborers were solicited. Immigration companies touted the fact, even in Japan, that you could earn twice as much money in the United States. And by 1910, there were 3,148 Japanese laborers in Oregon, although that was only 0.5%. Um, hello, I'm Lucy. I'm glad to be here. Um, labor contractors recruited workers from Japan, um, negotiating their wages and working conditions for a fee. One contractor was Shinzenburo Ban, who set up a business in Portland. For 10 cents a day, he brokered jobs with the railroad companies for Japanese immigrants. And he also had a store in Portland where he sold equipment and clothing to all the workers. And he had a newspaper, a Japanese newspaper, where he advertised all the jobs available for the immigrants. In the 1890s, Japanese section workers on the railroad were paid between a dollar and a dollar ten a day, and that was for working 10 hours a day, about $34.25 in today's dollars. They were paid less than Italians, less than Greeks, less than the Slavs, but it turned out it was almost twice as much money as they would have earned if they had been working on farms. Still, these uh, rail workers needed to pay their contractors 10 cents a day for their work. And they also had to pay a monthly fee for their food. And that was for poor, salty, nutritious food that often resorted to simply dumpling soup. Their work was oppressive from 11 to 14 hour days, living and sleeping in uh, boxcars and also the, the near starvation diets. By 1905, 26% of the Japanese in Oregon were rail workers, and that was almost 800 of them. One of them in 1912 was 15-year-old Tokuichi Maeda, who worked in Fall City at Black Rock. His job was to cut down trees and help to build the railway. He said, when I worked 10 or 12 hours a day, the next morning, I couldn't open my hands. For two or three months, I dipped them in hot water just to stretch the fingers back to normal, but often I secretly cried. He earned $1.75 a day for 10 hours or $47.19 today. So the loggers often cut Douglas fir um, that was sometimes 300 feet tall and 10 feet in diameter. Here you can see two loggers cutting a tree with a two-person crosscut saw. So our second question is, why and when did Japanese become mill workers? So Japanese became mill workers because although still hazardous and physically demanding, it was more stable than railroad work. And I think the con living conditions were better for sawmill workers as well. One sawmill worker wrote this haiku, look at these gnarled hands, symbol of my way of life and no shame at heart. The Japanese mill workers actually faced more racial hostility because they were competing with white workers. So many mills actually refused to hire them. But as the industry prospered and there was a labor shortage, there was really a need for the cheap labor that came from Japanese laborers. Um, by 1909, 2,500 mill workers in, in Oregon and Washington were Japanese. And that was about 4% of the workers. This is a map um, showing all the sawmills 
owned by Japanese or most likely where Japanese laborers worked. Um, this is a work in progress. This is the locations we've been able to find so far. So this is the D, the, uh, the Oregon Lumber Company in D, which began operations in 1906. The Japanese lived in a nearby camp town, which included a hotel, a boarding house, a store, and a small, small, very basic home. In 1918, one of those workers was Miyozo Yumibe. He was 17 years old. His first job was taking slab wood off the chains. And slab wood was the first rounded piece that was cut off of the log. He said that moving chains transported the slab wood to his area, and then they loaded the slab wood onto the freight car. Later, he was able to move the uneven flow of, of lumber um, on, the, on the chain equipment, and he used a stick with the hook. Although later, he told me, he was able to push the flow by uh, pushing buttons. He was 84 when I spoke with him and I asked him about how he felt about his job. And he said, oh yes, I liked my job. He worked seven days a week and on Sundays as a fireman, his pay 16 cents an hour or $1.28 a day, which comes to $22.17 today. During the depression, however, farm workers earned only 12 cents an hour. The Oregon American Lumber Company in Vernonia um, was established in 1917. And this mill was an inland mill transporting lumber by rail, similar to the ones that Gwen, the one that Gwen had mentioned. They transported by rail rather than rivers or streams. Um, in the 1920s, the owners were unable to hire enough local labor, so they brought in Japanese, Filipino, Indian, African-American workers, and workers from the American Midwest and South. The Japanese were paid a base rate that was equal to what the whites earned but their work was actually more physically demanding. One of those was the green chain. And that was considered the most grueling work because it required both skill and also judgment. You can see the green chain here. There were three uh, chains and workers along the side were required to move as fast as they could to grab pieces of lumber by size and grade and then sort them into piles along the side. The Nakata Company um, was one of the earliest Japanese owned lumber companies. It had a sawmill and a timber reserve in Wana, Oregon. And they exported a lot of hemlock, noble fir, and pine, which were highly sought after by Japanese clients. Wana was considered an anomaly, according to the executive director of the Clatsop County Historical Society. He said, a company town usually has the image of struggling workers held in economic slavery by a faceless corporation. And McAndrew Burns said, that was wrong with Wana and Westport. He said they were an almost idyllic existence filled with hard work, but also a sense of community. So our examples actually address both of those. In 1923, Isuke Okada was among 30 Japanese working at Wana. There was a shortage of helpers at the edge saw, he said, so he was moved there. And his job was to use a machine to remove the outer bark. My gloves got caught in a crack in the wood and the tips of, of two fingers on my right hand were cut off. A man from Okayama had his right arm cut off using the edge saw. The wage varied from $3.50 to $4 to $5 or $76.49 in today's uh, money. But I felt the danger of it and I quit. <laughs> 
From 1929 to 1933, Masaji Kusachi also worked at WANA. He told me when he was 82, that camp was dirty. 40 to 50 men living there, two to a room. The living conditions were poor. Our privy was just a hole with a bench long enough so four to five people could go to the bathroom at the same time. It was not fit for humans to live. And yet we were all young and we had a great time. Now here's the surprising part. Mr. Kusaji had a friend who played the violin. And so he learned to play the violin in order to kill time. So while a group of young men gambled, three of us played the violin. At first I practiced in my room because I had nothing but squeaks. But then we played children's, Japanese children's songs together. We played by ear and had a good time. That's the last thing I would have expected had I visited a, a lumber mill. On Sundays, in fact, in the summer, they played baseball with a Japanese crew from Westport Sawmill. So Gwen, I was thinking of you. <laughs> so what laws deterred the Japanese timber workers? The Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 to 1908 uh, was brought about um, after the San Francisco schools were segregated and Japanese children in separate schools. And so there was a concern by the United States government about diplomatic relationships between the United States and Japan. So the agreement was that San Francisco would no longer segregate Japanese children and Japan would stop issuing passports for laborers bound to the United States, except for family members. And so parents, wives, and children of Japanese laborers could come, but no one else. The challenge was that there were mostly men. From 1912 to 1920, though, the picture bride practice continued, and that was legal in Japan. So 7,000 of the immigrants were picture brides. Still, there were two men, or two, yeah, two, two men for every one woman in the United States. Lucy? Oh, oh next slide. I guess we don't need the slide necessarily. Um, the Ozawa, um, the Ozawa versus US Supreme Court case of 1922 determined that Takeo Ozawa, born in Japan, but who had lived in the US for 20 years, was fluent in English, attended University of California at Berkeley, went to a Christian church, but they determined he was not eligible for citizenship because he was not considered a quote unquote free white person, which was at the time synonymous with the Caucasian race. Then the Immigration Act of 1924 limited the number of immigrants allowed to enter the United States based on a national origins quota system. The quota provided visas to 2% of the total number of people of each nationality in the United States, according to the 1890 census. So populations poorly represented in the 1890 census, such as Italians, Greeks, Eastern European Jews, Poles, and other Slavs were prevented from immigrating. Asians were banned entirely. The 1933 National Industrial Recovery Act actually helped the Japanese. It guaranteed that workers had the right to organize and to bargain collectively. Mr. Yumibe told me that even when the workers were going on strike, Japanese workers kept on working because they wanted to be secure in their jobs. But when they finally settled, he told me, no join union, no job. And he was able to earn 40 cents an hour, which was much of an improvement from the 16 cents he had earned from 1918. He also earned time and a half for overtime and double time on Sundays. So he worked eight hours a day, Monday through Saturday, and then six hours on most Sundays. <laughs> 
Our final question, what social challenges do Japanese timber workers face? In 1895, outside Astoria, six Japanese laborers were staying in the segregated Japanese house and they were attacked by rioters. Jinzo Ikuni noted that shots were fired through the window at night. So the Japanese workers piled up mattresses to protect themselves and they laid low. The rioters yelled and cursed, but they finally left after an hour. Apparently they were farmers who worked on the railroad sections uh, during their off seasons and they were afraid that their livelihood would be lost. But the next day, the six Japanese laborers left. In Vernonia, there was a World War I labor shortage. And so the sawmills began to hire Japanese. And this was from 1914 to 1918. About 30 or 40 were sent to Vernonia. Umata Matsushima was one of them. He said one night, dynamite exploded near the Japanese camp. The local police investigated and they arrested a man who was not a local. No one was injured, but the Japanese laborers began to talk about going home. One of them though was an ex Navy man and he encouraged them by saying, if we retreat, it will besmirch the Japanese dignity. So the men stayed and this abominable thing, he said, never happened again. The St. John's Lumber Company on the Willamette River, located in North Portland, hired uh, 16 Japanese workers out of a total of 200. But when World War II was over, the company fired the Japanese in order to hire returning vets. Our last example is Toledo, where there was a Toledo mob. Um, around World War I, Toledo was actually the industrial hub of Lincoln County on the coast. Uh, it had a population of about 2,500 and they were well known because of the Sitka spruce that was prominent along the coast. Uh, during uh, the war, the military began building planes from the spruce trees because they were much lighter. And at first they hired military to do the jobs, but eventually they found other jobs for them. So then they called upon other workers. In April of 1925, the Pacific Spruce Corporation hired a Japanese contract crew of 10 to 12. Their job was to support or to sort the green chain that we talked about before. The lumber was taken off the conveyor belt and the laborers sorted it according to quality, length, size, width, and thickness. It was backbreaking work and the mills had difficulty keeping reliable workers. What they found though, was that rather than just taking one timber off at a time, Japanese laborers sometimes took off three or four at a time together, and they often worked in collaboration. They also were hired to work during the graveyard shift, so there would be no jobs lost, and the sawmill workers were fine about that. But Toledo business people were not. They did not want Japanese labor in their town. At first, the sawmill uh, owners were able to, to wield their economic influence. But eventually, a meeting was held in downtown Toledo, and 250 people opposed the Japanese laborers, and they formed the Lincoln County Protection League. The goal was to keep out Japanese. Chinese, Koreans, African-Americans, and workers from India. They even lobbied the government, the governor and the state labor commission. In July, 1925, two days after the Japanese workers had arrived, a local mob of 50 men urged on by 200 women and children <clears throat> 
goaded the Japanese workers. Uh, they invaded their homes. They took them out with one saying, for example, that said, get the Japs, string them up. They marched these men and their, and their families down the railroad tracks, forced 27 Japanese, four Filipinos and one Korean onto trucks. And they drove them 50 miles to the Corvallis train depot. A year later in 1926, five of the Japanese filed civil lawsuits in US District Court of Oregon against nine of the townspeople. The jury made their decision unanimous in favor of the Japanese. Civil rights could not be violated by the will of local people, they said. And Japanese had the right to work and to live without fear of intimidation or expulsion. They were awarded $2,500 in damages or a total of $3,190 with costs. That equaled $47,000 and $400 um, in today's dollars. So the story of Japanese in the Oregon timber culture is one of hope, hard work, and also hostility. It's not an easy story to tell. Uh, we're fortunate to be able to begin collecting artifacts, pictures, stories, documents um, to tell the story of these early timber workers. Um, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon is actually trying to collect more resources. So we encourage you, if you have photos, documents, artifacts, stories, please contact Lucy, the director of collections and exhibits at JAMO, Japanese American Museum of Oregon. And um, she'd be thrilled to talk to you as we continue to pull together a larger story of Japanese timber workers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Linda and Lucy. That was fantastic. And combined with Gwen's presentation, we've all amass a great deal of understanding about the contribution of these workers. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of hone in on the fact or the reason why we chose the title for this presentation, which was Timber. <clears throat> we didn't choose loggers and, and just share a photograph of um, some of the ways that these workers contributed. This was a trestle bridge built by uh, Japanese um, railroad workers in near the town, somewhere near the town of Mabel in Lane County. And without tracks, and without bridges such as this, those logs would have never gotten out of the mountains to come down to the sawmills to create jobs for the folks at the sawmills. This was a very integrated um, timber economy, which was, uh, at, you know, sort of necessarily dependent on rail transport for these logs. So um, again, without the workers helping to build structures such as this, um, we wouldn't have had the timber economy that we have in Oregon today. So um, again, thank you so much. And I, I want to take some of the questions that people have been asking and uh, share those with you so we can continue this conversation. So uh, one question is, has to do with sort of um, what kind of legal structures deterred these workers and Gwen really enlightened us about the laws at the time. And so the question is, if in the case of uh, black loggers and timber workers, if they were here in Oregon illegally, given the Oregon constitution at the time, did the logging companies get legal exemptions or were the workers hidden from view or were there some benevolent people that were trying to um, you know, incorporate them into the community? Thank you, um, Lisa. 
these are our wonderful questions and I so appreciate you getting into the nitty gritty of, of the work. And I've often asked um, if it was illegal, how did they, how did they make it happen? And, you know, as part of our story, the clan and a part of Oregon's story is the clan was the largest social club in the state of Oregon. They had clan, you know, women were extremely involved in that work and they helped to um, bring about a lot of passages that the men couldn't do alone and, and the kids had clan for kids. I, it was literally the largest social club and I know that um, in my research, there was a there have been um, um, marches throughout. I have a lot of images that I didn't use. I was hoping to try to keep it a little bit short so that we could talk about some of the other work there. Um, but in the town of Wallawa, there was um, witnessed two hundred people that marched that came from Lagrand, which was a very huge hub for a, um, a clavern. In fact, um, uh, the governor in the 1920s, Governor Pierce came out of Legrand. That's where I was born and raised. And my dad was doing business in Legrand where our family's the oldest black founding family that still lives in that space. And, you know, we've had a, a cross burned in our yard. The last cross that I know of that was burned in Legrand was in 1968. And it was when a gentleman who was at the college was um, dating a white woman. And his, his roommate at the time who actually called to tell me this story um, is um, a very famous Oregon uh, Western writer that said, I was his roommate and I remember looking out of my window because we were both on the football um, team at the time and just the way it made me feel and that he had talked to my father on multiple occasions about history and about some of what's going on around the state. So even though the Klan was huge and the Klan came up to my knowledge and to my documentation one time and the, the um, I want to say the manager, the um, the manager at the time dehooded him and said, basically, you know, we know who you are and don't come back again. And my father was there for that. And so I remember reading more detail about that, just that whole sense of waiting because the African American people from the South knew the score. We There were so many um, African Americans that had been hung from trees that didn't have any rights through the Jim Crow laws and through the sun downtown um, um, mentality that was very big in Oregon and, and a lot of our towns have been and still have those laws on the book. So if you're from a town in Oregon, look up the book sun downtown and they can help you find out if those laws are still in the book to not just take them off, but to um, changes the the nature of of bringing in people that represent your community to to guide the community's direction. It's so so key to to not just say that's a bad thing, but to say, wow, there's something I can do. This is a small thing that I can do to look it up and to find out more about it. But in in Willowa County, they absolutely burned crosses on the hillsides and it was their gentle reminder that you stay up at the campsite you stay up at the Maxville town site and and especially in the earlier years that that was a big part of it and as you know the town began to shift in 1933 they brought down those shacks uh, and they set them up in a park that was right beside the railroad track. And that's where a lot of the African-American people chose to live. Um, others went to Legrand. that's where my family went. In fact, a lot of the women left after a year of trying to be in that space and Legrand didn't have that um, separateness 
and they didn't have the segregated schools as well as they had black businesses there, black restaurant, they had a black blacksmithy. Um, they, my dad had many businesses after that um, in, in town as well. And so it was a way to um, black church. That was a church I grew up in having no idea that all of these elder deacons were all former loggers from the South. I had no idea of my history until 2003. And so there's some definitely personal connection to um, making that connection of what was going on there. The Jim Crow, it wasn't just the South, that was part of, the, of our American culture. And so the African-Americans absolutely knew how to respond in a way that kept them safe and kept them alive. However, when you're working in a logging camp and my family came from a logging camp in the South and hunted and fished and, and were closer to the land, the, I won't say the laws are different by any means, but the law of nature against man is a lot stronger when you have you know, wild animals you have to, you know, watch for and you have to protect that person that you're working by and working with. And my father was known, he saved at least one man's life. He picked him up and ran with him and carried him out of Maxville. That was a young white man who, you know, I, I, we're close to their descendants today. And so mm -hmm. I hope that yeah. helps answer that question in some I, way. I, I think it does. It, it seems like, you know, at the camp, some of the managers protected the black workers and then the community itself had to self-protect and they knew how to do that coming from the South. Well, and also I want to just reiterate too with the law, with the, you know, with the idea that they were surrounded by clans, but the fact is that Maxville generated a great deal of money that had not been seen in this county and in Union County. And it was, I, I, I mean, I wanted, I, this is, I don't have this proven reference, but it, it's that sense of, are we going to scare away the talented help that's bringing in all this money. So it's the forefathers, the town mm -hmm. fathers that are going to lose, the township's going to lose the money if the clan gets involved in dismantling in any way, this flow of cash, this flow of, of revenue course. that mm -hmm. people hadn't seen before. And so mm -hmm. I, I know that that played a deep role in, um, in Maxville. And I just want to cross over a little bit to the Vernonia side too, that I know that um, Linda had talked about the experience of the Japanese, but the experience of the black loggers there was very dire. They were not being treated well at all. And they, um, there was um, Beatrice Kennedy came in. She, um, I believe she was the first black woman that graduated from law school in Oregon, but she and her husband had a paper in Portland, the advocate, and she went out and talked to them and brought the NAACP in to the Vernonia site and made it very, um, made a vocal statement and article to let people know how those folks were being treated to get them some relief. And Great. so- yeah. Thank you. And, and Linda, I was wondering, it's sort of the flip side maybe of this conversation, um, you talking to me a little bit about uh, strikes and collective bargaining and, and how that Im impacted the Japanese and also the uh, black workers at the time. How, how did the workers of color fit into any kind of um, labor disputes and things like that, if you know? Well, interesting. Um, the, the Japanese laborers who came were actually quite different from the blacks in terms of they came because many of them considered themselves birds of passage. They thought they were coming for three to five years. They were going to earn a lot of money. Then they were going to go back home and buy their own property and live good lives. They didn't expect to stay. But what they found was it was more difficult to, to save money. Um, they ended up uh, 
they were they were getting to be older middle class middle aged men so then they had wives uh, picture brides who came in they had families pretty soon their families um, their kids were going to American schools they were American citizens and that was very different um, the other part of that though getting back to your question is that part of the the system in Japan of values is that you pay high respect to those who um, have authority. And so that meant you didn't always question what your boss or what the emperor or someone else said. So when the, um, the, the managers of the mills or the corporations or the logging companies set the, the parameters, they simply worked as hard as they could and tried to toe the line and get the job done. Um, that's why Mr. Yumibes and Indy said, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to lose our jobs. This was an authority figure who was telling us this is how much you're going to get paid. And so we didn't cross the line. We, we went on strike. I think that probably endeared them to the companies, but um, the, that was just their value system and how they were raised. So in answer to your question, uh, the Japanese laborers really didn't feel comfortable, as I understand, in terms of uh, crossing the picket line, but they, they worked hard and they were able to, to benefit from uh, the, the results of the collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So um, th that's great. Um, during certain times like the depression and then again into the 30s, mills closed down because of just the economics of the time. And that yeah. we have a whole conversation about over logging and flooding the market, et cetera, et cetera. But when these mills closed down, what happened to the workers who were Japanese or African-American? Maybe we can start with Gwen first and then go on to Linda. If there was no job there, what happened next for them? Well, I, I mean, it was very different for different groups of people. Um, my father and my grandfather and um, grandmother and a, and a lot of our family came to Oregon in 1923. And so there was a different pushback um, for a lot of the, the um, issues that were going on and especially around um, unions. They absolutely did not want unions and then African-American workers were considered a competition from the white workers. And so in the early years when there was a lot of talk and actually the mill in Wallawa um, you know, the, the owner made a statement. It's like, if you guys bring the union here, we're going to close down the big mill. And they did just that. Um, but it wasn't that both sides were going to be um, collaborative about um, getting support for the work. And, and like we have today, OSHA and WISHA and all of those protections, that wasn't an, an option or a part of that, that particular story. And so that's um, something that is, has been part of the telling of the story and looking at the documentation and, and some of the um, references that we have about um, the white South and the new competition that, you know, what do we do with this competition instead of saying, you know, that we work together. And so there was definitely um, a pushback and a crux on that part of it. But truly there were some folks that came in the later years and they moved to different spaces. Um, some folks went to California to uh, do their logging. And I know my father moved, he went and spent some time in Weed, California, which was the largest um, timber, you know, operation in the United States with over 6,000 in its heyday people. They had what, four black jute joints. They had all of these pieces there. And as I mentioned, in the work that the African-Americans actually lived in that space. 
um, and what they had different too is that in the African Americans and weed work in the yard inside of the mill area only. Whereas in Maxville, they did, weren't allowed to work in the mill, they worked out in the woods only. So some of those workers, for instance, I know that my father left that space, moved to Baker City, bought a logging truck and began, began to be, to haul and to be a contractor. And so I, people found other ways and different work. And there are certain parts of the season because if, it, if it's you know deep snow and all of that, some would do different works in, in La Grande or um, um, different parts that were close that they could come back or ride the rail and come back when the season was on. And so there were multiple ways that people dealt with, you know, how do we um, diversify what our skill sets are? And again, LaGrande had a, a lot bigger community. And then a lot of our families, of course, during um, after 33 and the banks were failing and um, they moved to Portland. And uh, what we found is in these areas, when the young men and women became of age to work in the communities, they couldn't find jobs for the most part in those communities. Um, there were certain things that we could do, but once it became saturated, a lot of those folks also moved to Portland and to mm -hmm. different locations outside of the rural landscape and took their families with them. Oh, thank you for that. And I want to give Linda a chance to answer this question yeah. as well. I don't have a, a ready answer, Lucy May, but I'll give you give you a little bit of background. Um, and actually, when the Japanese came, they, they said that a high percent of Japanese came from the southwest part of um, Japan, and that was where uh, the the crops were. There was more difficulty with the crops. And they said that people there were a little bit more seafaring, they were a little bit more courageous. And so many of the people who came to Japan were willing to, to work hard, they were just willing to take on jobs that they didn't even understand, and willing and, and timber wasn't necessarily something that was in their, their bailiwick. And so I think um, many of the choices they made were really to try to get back to the land. Many of them were from farms in Japan, only 13% of the land is arable and a farm because there's so little land, uh, farmers had maybe at the most three acres at a time. So being able to either become business people or especially like my family to begin to clear land and um, go into farming, that was really important. And so Japanese in California, Oregon and Washington um, became quite prosperous in farming. Lucy, do you wanna add anything? We can't hear you. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> so there was a situation in Hood River and other parts of Oregon too, where if you cleared someone's land of trees, you were given a portion of that land for your own use. So lots of Japanese did that and they created their own farms, which were in Hood River especially, which were super rich and really established that community. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a crossover from working in timber to working in farming and then owning land. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting question and you may not know, um, from uh, Jolie Boa, whether the Japanese and the black workers ever came together in solidarity, uh, maybe around wages or working conditions. There may not be evidence, but just in case you know of something, I thought I would ask. I don't, but I was struck by the parallels when Gwen was talking, the same kinds of issues that black African-American workers faced, Japanese Americans, they were, um, they were sought, um, sometimes at lower wages, sometimes they were, um, they, most of the time they were isolated in their own separate housing. Uh, 
where uh, the, the, the regular workers had running water and sewer systems sometimes. Um, the minority camps did not. You know, it was touted that they had running water and they had their own communal bathrooms, but in fact, the, the situation was much substandard. Um, so, you know, the, the living conditions, the working conditions, often they were given the kinds of jobs that no other workers would touch, but they needed the money and they were willing mm -hmm. to work hard. And that's a, that's a tough story. Well, and Linda, you also mentioned about the fact that the food was sparse or it was very low quality when they were rail workers and that it improved somewhat um, when they worked um, in the closer to, I want to say, what did you say they worked at the, in the mill or just, or out in the? Uh, this was um, in the railroad. Okay. So um, I know that the food that was provided for the, for Maxville and a lot of the towns, they, because they were the workers, they were the, the tools, the, the, a typical amount of food would be six, I mean, it would be 6,000, 6,000 calories per day because they were workhorses. They had to work all the time. And there were a lot of folks that provided, um, you know, they would bring in like a half of a, um, um, a beef that's brought in on a hide that, that, you know, they'll bring in with the horses during the winter time or whatever that looks like. But they, I mean, they, if they didn't feed all the workers well, and then they would be cutting their own, you know, <laughs> foot in that respect, because you, you know, you wanted those folks to work those long days every day and to have maximum amount of energy. So getting back to the railroad, um, the Japanese railroad workers, when they were out on the rails, um, if they saw a cow or a deer, they were quick to, to kill that animal because they needed the protein. Um, and the same, I interviewed a woman who was um, um, married to a man who was working um, in Huntington in Eastern Oregon. And it was a railroad stockyard where they were repairing the equipment. And she was assigned to be a cook. And she said, she finally started planting vegetables because the men were so hungry, they didn't have enough nutrients and she needed to do anything she could to feed them well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody had to pitch in. Um, it's you true. You did what you could and you worked communally. I, I don't know of stories of um, African-American and Japanese workers banding together that would have made sense. Nope, and I, I know of, um, there's some anecdotal stories that I've been um, um, conversing with someone from Vernonia about um, a Japanese gentleman that gave a parrot um, after meeting with this um, African-American logger there and that um, they had stayed up and, and they had had th this Japanese logger had shared his sake with this gentleman. So at, when the gentleman came home, he came home with a parrot and a bunch of um, bird seed. And they had kept that parrot for many years. And that's an anecdotal story that I've heard, but we're in the process of, you know, getting those other stories from the folks out of Vernonia. And other than that, I mean, truly um, thinking about the the Mount Emily Lumber Company and, and the interviews from that. Um, my interviews have essentially been from a, a Native woman that grew up there as a little girl and taught, and I, I interviewed her right before she passed away, but she talked about just the relationships with the Greek people that had been there. And some of those Greek loggers also worked at Maxville and they actually have a Greek, um, um, uh, cemetery out mm -hmm. near near there because they didn't come with any of their family, just the men. And so uh, it's just all Greek men that are buried in that space. But she spoke and just remembered and she called him Quichi was the name of the gentleman. And she said he was a foreman mm -hmm. um, at the Mount Emily Lumber Company. And she talked about the day when 
two government men came and um, told them that they had to go um, into the internment spaces. And that she, what I loved about the conversation was she said, we all stood for them. And we told them that you, you have no right. They're not our enemies. These people are our friends. And mm -hmm. that to me was extremely powerful to hear um, um, her memories from when she was a girl and how she saw her community stand for that group. That was pretty amazing. That's a great story. Um, I just want to mention that we have about 10 minutes left or so. Um, we're going to put into the chat a poll that folks can take while I ask the last question, and it's a thoughtful question, so do take the poll. Uh, we'd love your feedback, and then also do listen to this question, and don't forget to register for the Environmental Justice Pathway Summit coming up on April 9th and 10th. So I'm just curious, we've talked a lot about labor and jobs and how people of color are received in the community. Do you see patterns, parallels to what is happening today um, with frontline and essential workers of today and how raising the issue around frontline and essential workers has kind of come front and center with COVID. And maybe we could start with Linda first this time. Uh -huh. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of the attorney who supported the Japanese laborers when they went to court. And he made a statement, something like, uh, you know, when the hard work needs to be done, the jobs that the other workers won't take, uh, the African-American and the foreigners take those jobs. And and that's, that's what happened then. Uh, the African-American, the, the Japanese, the Chinese, others um, came in, did the jobs like the green chain that were more difficult that others did not want to take. Um, they were paid less, they worked hard because they had to. And in some ways, they, if you only knew one Japanese American or one African American, in many ways, they were the one that they represented them all. That wasn't what it was supposed to be, but that's what they ended up representing. And, right. um, and that was tough. They were the essential workers of their time because the government needed them for, for the, the military planes, the people needed them for their livelihoods. And as we look today, it just makes me feel so sad that my grandparents and Gwen's grandparents uh, might not have recognized that we, that their grandchildren would be facing what we are facing now with discrimination and, um, and all the issues that are occurring right now um, with, with some outright racism. Um, the essential workers, what do they say? Half of them now are ethnic minorities and, um, and they're paid much less than others. So, so we don't want history to repeat itself. As a teacher, what's important to me is that we learn, we understand the facts, we begin to learn from them, we learn from our past mistakes and more and more now we begin, we need to begin to understand what's right, what's wrong, how are we all the same? And what can we do to support each other? Uh, just one comment. I really appreciate some of the comments from the chats and I hope that you'll share your stories, your artifacts, your documents because those will enrich us as we're beginning to learn more and more so we can share more stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Gwen, what about the parallels to today? Yes, yeah, so the parallels today, there's still, you know, it is absolutely a different, um, there are different sectors of people that are involved in um, timber workers and forestry workers and a lot of 
those folks are um, Latinx or, or Hispanic people that are involved and they've got, um, you know, working work cards to work specifically for those, but only in some cases for one particular worker. And, and there's a lot of circumstances where they have no rights with, you know, they're not put up in housing that's adequate. The same thing with food or having their paychecks held back. There's some, there's a lot of things that have been going on um, with this new um, group of workers in that space. And as I begin to um, connect with a lot of the folks working with those forestry workers, it's, it's just so important to really understand what's the same and what's changed. And I think that there were more relationship building going on because of the time frame that they lived in yeah. And here there's more of a, a separateness of building relationships between the worker and the people that you work for and and even the community that you serve or that you are providing sort of um, an outlying um, revenue for that those connections aren't happening in the same way. And so that makes it even more, I think, uh, of a, a, a stressor on communities and on the workers and the people that are in those businesses because you, there's no center. The center has, has become soft and, and um, just the people that are deeply affected are, are, there's just, I don't know what the answer is, but uh -huh. it's, it's truly prevalent today. Yes. And it seems like the fear we can imagine that was felt in the Maxville camp when those KKK folks rode in. Mm -hmm. Seems to me, I would imagine that that same kind of fear is felt today with the threats of violence and the actual carrying out of violence against communities. Well, and just the idea of having your employer hold your working visa over your head to control you. To me, that's just, I mean, it would be different if you knew you could um, motivate to a different camp or do something, you know, it, I just don't know. I can't com imagine it. And I don't know that it's, you can, we can compare the frustration and the fear and um, the hopelessness in some ways that people um, come to when they make their decisions. Well, we unfortunately have to leave it here, even though there's so much more we could be talking about. And I know both, all three of you um, have a lot of knowledge yet to be shared uh, that we don't have time for in a 90 minute webinar, but um, we'll continue to make time. There was a, a question in the chat just about, are you gonna put out books or, or collect these photographs. I know um, Lucy is planning something for the museum. Might want to mention that. And of course, there's the Maxwell Heritage Center. We can go mm -hmm. and see it there. But Lucy, what do you think? We are still um, in the very beginning stages of understanding this story. So mm -hmm. there probably won't be an exhibit for quite a while, but uh, <laughs> we are still gathering material. And we do have some great um, books about Japanese loggers, which oh. are in Japanese. So we have to get those translated, which that's a long process, but we hope to begin to do that. And I want to invite everyone to stay tuned to our new museum, which will be, uh, we're moving from in uh, Old Town in Portland. We will be located at 411 Northwest Landers Street. So we have a new museum, a new permanent exhibit, and an exhibit about um, Japanese American women. So I hope you will all join us. We're having a um, virtual opening May 6th. We won't be open fully to the public for a while given the COVID restrictions, but there will be an open, you can go to our website, jamo.org to find out more information.
I've been there. I it's absolutely wonderful. I can't wait to be able to go back. Yeah. And we do have our traveling exhibit as well as we've created course curriculum for kids and we're working with the colleges around the work that we're doing at the Maxill site. And um, we're getting a lot of that work um, online. So we look forward to being able to expand um, the connection with the kids when they come to the traveling exhibit, when we're all over Oregon. Thank you all and uh, more learning to come. See you all at the summit, I hope, and at the museums when we can start to travel and visit Lucy, Linda, and Gwen at their respective museums. Hey, that would be terrific. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs> Good night. Thank you.